But how do experts fight back when the assailant is the one with the weapon? Fighting back is your last option. If you could not avoid it, solve the situation as fast as possible and leave the area. When fleeing isn't an option, the first obstacle to overcome is panic. In a life or death situation against an armed opponent, how does someone conquer their fear and take control of their body's natural instinct to defend itself? Helping us answer this question is Jonathan Dugas, a police officer who is also a Kraft Maga instructor, and Amir Peretz, our self-defense expert. Their first situation is all too common in street attacks, an assailant with a club or bat. Okay, Amir, what are my options if somebody comes after me with something like this? Well, overall, the concept and the main principle is to close the distance suddenly and explosively so the lower and closer you get, you deal with less resistance. The natural reaction to attack with a bat is to just to raise your hand over your head and cover up. And that caused people to break their arm because of the angle, 90 degree angle. Human long bones are weakest horizontally, so absorbing the full impact across the arm is a recipe for disaster. Just leaning forward and sending your hand forward, you see that you're already starting to deflecting and redirecting the stick. Right. If you lower yourself more, the stick will be deflected away from you. The surprising secret? Don't shrink away from the strike. Lunge towards it. It appears to work, moving into the baton instead of away and deflecting its impact at an angle. But will the physics bear out the theory? What we're going to do is we're going to try to test that theory out using a couple different things. First of all, we have a stick that we've instrumented. Okay, so this is a standard kind of stick that you might come up against, right? Mm -hmm. So, and what I've done is we've put an accelerometer on the top of it. We're going to have you actually test this theory on a crash test dummy. In place of a real human is our crash test dummy with its arms strapped into a common defensive position, perpendicular to the angle of attack. Sensors on the baton will measure the speed and impact of the blow. Amir, are you ready? Ready. Three, two, one, strike. Ah! Ah! Amir swings the baton at 25 meters per second, delivering a strike of 1,076 kilograms of force. The nightstick Amir is using is a standard police baton made of hardened nylon that flexes on impact. Yet it delivers over a ton of force, easily enough to break both the ulna and the radius bones of the forearm. The strike hits both bones across their weakest axis. This injury could be debilitating. The victim would have no chance of escape. The crew repositions the dummy for the next test, but now its arms are extended forward, in line with the angle of attack, the angle that experts recommend for self-defense. Okay, Amir, is this basically how someone should react when someone comes at him with a bat? About, yes. Okay, so kind of in this position. That's correct. Okay. Okay, you ready, Amir? Ready. Three. Two, one, strike. Ha! 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 Once again, Amir swings at 25 meters per second, but the data is strikingly different. Because of the angle of the arm, he deals the dummy only a glancing blow, with a measured impact of just 90 kilograms of force. One tenth the force of the initial strike, and not nearly as likely to break bones. The club then slides down the side of the arm and is deflected away from the body. It's pure physics and geometry. The defensive move gives the defender a chance to escape. Okay, I think we can see pretty clearly it's a lot different, right? The concept is again to close the distance, you deflect and redirect the attack. So we're talking the difference between having an abrasion or a scratch versus a broken arm. Well, that's, that's great information to know, because I never would have thought of that. But what if the attack weapon is a gun? 
It's one of the most terrifying attack scenarios. Out of nowhere, a gun to the back. When the attacker has a gun, it's a very dangerous situation. You should only fight back when you have no choice, and you must know there are things you can do. Is there a way to disarm an assailant in this dangerous situation? Okay, everyone, we're going to show a defense against a threat with a gun to my back. We are using a real gun with some munition rounds. So it's extremely dangerous. The set turns into a hot range now. I want to see everyone putting their safety glasses on now. Jonathan Dugas will serve as the bad guy in this scenario. He'll be using some munition rounds. These are training cartridges that fire a non-lethal, but sometimes painful, die marker instead of a metal bullet. Amir will try to disarm his attacker without getting shot. Move. Stay down, stay down, on your stomach, on your stomach. He took control of the situation. Spread your hands, spread your feet. Look away from... But how did he do it? Slow motion reveals the secret behind Amir's incredible takedown. First, he notes which hand his attacker is using to hold the gun and turns inward, taking his body out of the line of fire. This allows him to control the arm holding the gun. Amir then seizes the weapon and uses the gun itself as leverage against the attacker's wrist and trigger finger. Amir's expertise even allows him to reverse the gun and use it himself. For the average person, the goal is to wrench the gun free and get away fast. The entire exchange takes under five seconds. On your stomach! On your stomach! It's clear that physics, physiology and training can help fend off an attack. Turn an everyday object into a weapon and even turn the tables on an armed assailant. But what if there was a way to actually predict an attack and prevent it from happening altogether? They may be on their way home from work or returning to their car after shopping. Suddenly, their life is in danger. Give me the car keys. Give me the car keys. Don't play with me. Give me the car keys. Take it. The first step in self-defense is as simple as it sounds. Pay attention. Experts call it situational awareness. Situational awareness means being more aware of your surroundings. You know where you are, you look around, and you recognize a potential danger. You can react earlier, and you can actually deal with it much better. To show how situational awareness really works, sports physiologist David Sandler has devised a scenario. We'll compare the awareness levels of a self-defense expert to those of an average individual. Television director, John Brenkus. Every day we wander around, unaware of our surroundings, and leave ourselves vulnerable to attack. So we have John, who represents sort of the average, ordinary, everyday person. For him, detailed awareness comes very low on his list of priorities. I think that I'm like the typical person, where I'm not paying particular attention to any one thing. I'm usually on my cell phone and usually just sort of occupied in my own thoughts. And we have Amir, who has over 20 years of martial arts experience, three years in the Israeli military, and has been teaching self-defense for over 15 years. For Amir, awareness is second nature. Well, uh, naturally, is to pay more attention to your surroundings, meaning where you are, who is around you. I must stress not to confuse being alert with being alarmed. It's not as if I'm paranoid and I'm looking for attacks. No, I'm just more aware of where I am. Joshua Jacoban from Applied Science Laboratories outfits both subjects with an eye tracker. It will reveal everything they're looking at and what they're not. All right, so John, while you're getting fitted here, plan is we're gonna have you go for a little stroll and we're gonna see what happens as you're, uh, as you're taking your walk. 
So this is seeing exactly what I'm seeing. This is seeing exactly where you're looking. All right. The objective of this demonstration is to illustrate the difference between an expert's situational awareness and the untrained eye of our average man. All right, so John, we want you to walk up the stairs over there, walk down around, and come back down the stairs and come back to us. All right, I'm going to be on my cell phone like I always do. All right, you ready? Ready. Go. Right away, John is too focused on walking to the stairs to notice the two threats to his left. The eye tracker records what John is looking at, but there's a big difference between looking and seeing. His sight lines are erratic, and although he's generally aware of his surroundings, he's not focusing on key details that could alert him of a possible threat. Now Amir's trained eye will be put to the test. As I walk through, I may prevent a situation just by seeing few steps ahead. Amir's eyes sweep back and forth in an organized pattern. I add the element of deterrence. I don't seem like a victim. If a potential threat do come up, I know how to react faster and better because I was able to spot it a fraction of a second earlier. The difference between what John and Amir saw is striking. The eye tracking software reveals that John glanced at his subjects, but he paid more attention to obstacles in his way. Amir's perception was rather different. He scanned each subject thoroughly, looking for small details that would indicate a threat level. By just being aware, one can increase reaction time by 300%. Looking at the waistband, looking at the arms, I'm looking for some bulge or protrusion, something outstanding or suspicious. Amir's heightened sense of awareness could have saved his life. I didn't see anything really that Amir saw. I was just concerned with getting to where I was going. If this was a real life scenario and if any one of these guys was a threat, I, it absolutely did not register with me, not because I'm not capable of recognizing it, but because I'm not trained to look at the world that way. So step one in self-defense is situational awareness and avoiding trouble before it happens. But what do experts do when trouble finds them? and they have no choice but to fight back. Give me the car keys, give me the car keys, don't play with me. Their first enemy isn't even the bad guy. It's their own mind and their own body. It's called the fight or flight response. And it could either make them victims or fighting machines. The body's first reaction to a threat is in the brain. The hypothalamus region alerts glands in the body to the potential danger, which instantly flood the bloodstream with stress hormones like adrenaline. These hormones increase respiration and heart rate. Some blood vessels throughout the body constrict, limiting blood flow to less vital areas. Others dilate, sending nutrients and oxygen to the largest muscles like the quads, triceps and calves to prepare them for action. Attention to hearing decreases, pupils dilate, and vision narrows, focusing on the threat. The physiological change is a transformation of mind and body. Give me the car keys, give me the car keys, don't play with me. The critical question is will he shut down or defend himself? Instead of running, he chooses to fight back. When you're attacked, adrenaline pours into your system. Through knowledge and experience, you learn to use it to your advantage. Data shows that harnessing this adrenaline can actually increase a person's reaction time by over 100%. And strength by more than 300%. Through training and understanding, you can move from a passive state to an aggressive state without hesitation. Stay down, stay down, stay down! 
So being aware of your surroundings and understanding how to use the body's natural reaction to a threat are key in self-defense. But what about an unseen attacker? It's no accident that criminals often choose the cover of night or dimly lit areas to attack their prey. Criminals choose to attack in the dark because it's easier for them to sneak up on their victims and later it's harder for them to, to be recognized. We wanted to know if fighting blind is really possible. To test this attack scenario, we've asked our self-defense specialist, Amir Peretz, to wear an assortment of special sensor modules. The things I do for science. So what I've done is we put 12 different sensors on your body right now, and what we'll be able to tell from those sensors is how fast your arms are moving, how fast your legs are moving, how much power you're generating. It's called the FAB system, which stands for Functional Assessment of Biomechanics. This network of three-dimensional sensors will track Amir's body movement in real time, so the scientists can analyze the exact dimensions of his reactions. Okay, we're all calibrated out. So we're going to simulate this attack. So I think we're going to make it a little more challenging, right? Yeah, we're not going to make it that easy for you. We'd like to see you do it with a blindfold on. This is exactly the test that is most realistic because self-defense means that you start in a point of disadvantage. Playing the aggressor is mixed martial arts fighter Sam Said. We brought in a pro because Amir will be fighting back for real. Okay, Amir, in order to get our best numbers, we want you to be able to go out as hard as you can on Sam. So we've put a protective suit on Sam because we want you to be as realistic as possible in terms of the moves that you make when you counter his attack. So, David, you right. want to go ahead and put the blindfold on him. So we're taking away your primary sense here. This should be quite interesting. Yeah. When you're attacked in the dark and your vision is limited, you must rely on different senses in order to protect yourself. If it's through touch, if it's through hearing and feeling where the attacker is. Amir has no idea where the attacker will be coming from or what he will do. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> The struggle happens so quickly, it's hard to see what really occurs. The data and slow motion footage reveal his strategy. As soon as Amir senses the aggressor's point of contact, he minimizes the space between them so he can control the situation without his sense of sight. He relies on his sense of touch and actually pushes his body into the attacker determining his opponent's body position, weight distribution, and possible exposures. I grabbed him right away and kept him closer to me, see what his weight is, counter-attack, and throw him off. And it doesn't matter whether you are 150 pounds or 300 pounds. You have to use momentum and leverage to your advantage. This time, Sam will attack from the front. Three, two, one, go. Again, the exchange is over in a matter of seconds. And once again, fighting completely blind, Amir comes out on top. The data reveals how. The moment Amir feels the attacker's hands on his neck, he makes the split-second decision to react both defensively and offensively. He focuses his defense on eliminating the biggest threat, the chokehold. He knees the attacker's body backwards. Then he places his right hip into the assailant's pelvis, just below the center of gravity. But he uses his right hand and actually grabs the back of the assailant, pulling him into his own body. 
From there, it's simple leverage. And within seconds, the attacker is not only stunned and off balance, he's a human rag doll. Of course, for the average person, the knee to the groin may have been enough to effect an escape. For one final test, we've added yet another element of surprise. The attacker now has a bowie knife. And Amir doesn't know it. Three, two, one, go. Give me your money. Amir's first reaction went straight to the greatest danger, the knife. From here, he can both immobilize the biggest threat and detect his attacker's body position. Amir moved his hands at 22 meters per second, around 80 kilometers per hour. Then you can trust other senses to continue and counterattack. He follows it up with rapid fire kicks to the groin to subdue his attacker entirely. The whole exchange took less than five seconds. Amir's ability to gauge the relative position of his own body and the body of his enemy is called kinesthetic awareness. Kinesthetic awareness is where an athlete is really aware of all of their surroundings. Go. Amir obviously has an incredible ability to be aware of everything around him. You take away one sense, his other senses are heightened, and he's that much more powerful, and he's still able to be in balance and have great coordination and produce incredible power. <laughs> The key to self-defense is being prepared both physically and mentally. Self-defense begins with the mindset of not thinking of yourself like a victim. So what we saw here is that being aware of your surroundings, being able to kind of use your other senses, knowing the anatomical weaknesses, you can pretty much fend off any attack even if you can't see. It is very hard, but it's important to remember there are things you can do through training 